Moreover, the rites and prayers of the Eucharistic sacrifice signify and show no less clearly that the oblation of the victim is made by the priests in company with the people. For not only does the sacred minister, after the oblation of the bread and wine, when he turns to the people, say the significant prayer, Pray, brethren, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God the Father Almighty. Right, so he, the point that he's making is that there is a participation of the people in offering the sacrifice. That, that is certain. But also the prayers by which the divine victim is offered are generally expressed in the plural number. So teijitur, uh, ferimus, etc. The offertory and the canon normally have a plural number in, in mentioning the offering. And in these it is indicated more than once that the people also participate in this august sacrifice inasmuch as they offer the same. The following words, for example, are used, for whom we offer, or who offer up to thee, see in plural, we beseech thee, uh, therefore beseech thee, O Lord, to be appeased and to receive this offering of our bounded duty as also of thy whole household, we thy servants as also thy whole people to offer unto thy most excellent majesty of thine own gifts bestowed upon us a pure victim, a holy victim, a spotless victim. All right. So the, there is definitely a, a participation of the people in offering the Mass, but they do so, and he's going to say this, through the priest, as they, they are incapable of offering themselves. They can only participate in what he is doing. Nor is it to be wondered at that the faithful should be raised to this dignity. By the waters of baptism, as by common rite, Christians are made members of the mystical body of Christ, the priest, and by the character which is imprinted on their souls, they are appointed to give worship to God. So they are capable of giving worship. They can offer sacrifice. Remember, Saul offered sacrifice. And Samuel uh, chastised him for it. That was one of the reasons for Saul's fall, was that he offered sacrifice. He was not capable of offering sacrifice. So there, there is, is, baptism gives the possibility of offering something to God, but through the priest at the altar. Uh, thus they participate according to their condition in the priesthood of Christ. But there is also a more profound reason why all Christians, especially those who are present at Mass, are said to offer the sacrifice. In this most important subject, it is necessary in order to avoid giving rise to a dangerous error that we define the exact meaning of the word offer. The unbloody immolation at the words of consecration when Christ is made present upon the altar in the state of a victim is performed by the priest and by him alone as the representative of Christ and not as the representative of the faithful. Very important point. See? Christ is the priest. He is the offerer of every Mass. Right, so the, if the, he is not the representative of the faithful, which is the general idea in the new Mass. But it is because the priest places the divine victim upon the altar that he offers it to God the Father as an oblation for the glory of the Blessed Trinity and for the good of the whole Church. Now the faithful participate in the oblation understood in this limited sense after their own fashion and in a twofold manner, namely because they do not, they not only offer the sacrifice by the hands of the priest, but also to a certain extent in union with him. Uh, 
That's where unakum comes in. You see, the faithful are doing what the priest is doing. So if he is unakum, they are unakum too. Right? There are some people that say, well, I don't agree with unakum, but I like to go to Mass. You cannot, if he is unakum, you are too. He is the pilot of the airplane and you are the passenger. You are going where he is going. It is by reason of this participation that the offering made by the people is also included in liturgical worship. See, so that's, it, 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 in modern times it comes down to taking the collection during the offertory. And that is not merely a, a gesture to, it's not merely a good time to take the collection uh, when things are quiet and during the offertory. No, there is a, it is a leftover of what used to be done and that is a, a procession where they brought all sorts of things, mostly for the, you know, cakes and pies, or you know, in the sense that many things that the priests could use, you know, the, the just sustaining the priests. And they would put that over on the side, and the deacon would accept it, but they did bake the bread for the altar as a sign of their own participation in what was going on at the altar. See? And so that, that, but that has devolved into taking the collection. And Bishop Selway tells me now they do it on their phones. Instead of throwing money in a basket, they take out their phones and send a, a donation to the church. That's what they do. <laughs> he says hardly anybody writes a check anymore. So, yes. They do that during the offertory? Yes. <laughs> I know. It's good. They could just throw their phones in and then we'll do it for them. <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah, I think it's a little, you know, whatever, but that's what they do apparently. So, let this then be the intention and aspiration of the faithful when they offer up the divine victim in, in the Mass. For if, as St. Augustine writes, our mystery is enacted on the Lord's table, that is, Christ our Lord himself, who is the head and symbol of that union through which we are the body of Christ and members of his body. If St. Robert Bellarmine teaches, according to the mind of the doctor of Hippo, that's St. Augustine in case you don't know, that in the sacrifice of the altar there is signifies, signified the general sacrifice by which the whole mystical body of Christ, that is, all the city of redeemed, is offered up to God through Christ the high priest. So as I said, the mystical body must be crucified with the physical body of Christ. So the whole mystical body is offered up, sacrificed to God. And the way you participate is by offering your daily crosses to God in, through the Mass, through the action of the Mass. See? So whatever, everybody has crosses, take up your cross and follow me. And we just had the, the, uh, the Gospel today, if you don't take up your cross, you're not worthy of me. See, so the cross is something that is embedded in the mystical body, and that's why you make the sign of the cross, you are crossed, as I said, at baptism, you are crossed at, at confirmation, that when you die, you get the sign of the cross on, with oil. See, an extra unction. When you're ordained, you, you get the, when you're tonsured, you get the sign of the cross on your head. The, the, uh, the, uh, your hands are done with the, the cross. You know, when you're ordained, you're anointed in the cross. I mean, it, it is implanted in the soul at baptism, the cross. See, as the as the way in which redemption takes place, and redemption, as I said, needs to be applied. The redemption that took place on Calvary needs to be applied to the faithful throughout all the ages, and that's the purpose of the church. It is the purpose of the mass. It is the purpose of the sacraments. See, it's the application. All right. So you have to understand that that. That the, you see, the, the, again, the Protestant idea is that the, the toll at the bridge is paid. Christ paid the toll at the crucifixion, so we don't have to worry anymore. It's all paid. 
See, so we do not have to crucify ourselves. We do not have to offer our daily crosses to God. See, it's, it completely strips humanity of any kind of supernatural acts. See, then it says, well, the, you know, the bill is paid, so now live a, a nice life. As you become naturalist right away. And that's what happened to Christian Europe. Instead of having its mind on God all the time and heaven, uh, then it became commercialized and, and especially in the northern countries that went Protestant. Yes? What would be the difference in the offertory of the traditional Latin Mass versus the Novus Ordo? Because they bring things also. Yes, but they bring things up as if it were the sacrifice, you see. Okay. Not the remote matter of the sacrifice. See, the, the host, the little host on the, on the paten, represents the whole mystical body. So it represents the, the not, you know, it's not merely a host to be consecrated, it represents the whole mystical body. So that's why you have all of those prayers in the traditional Mass talking about that. And this is our sacrifice. A piece of bread is meaningless to God. <laughs> what, what God is pleased with is the sacrifice, of course, of His Son and the, you might say, the co-sacrifice of the, of the whole mystical body. See, and that, that represents it, you see, and therefore the the, the bringing up of the gifts in, the, you know, in, say, like in ancient times was a way of showing we are represented at the altar by these things. It's not, it's not giving God some bread and wine. But in the new Mass, if it's not actually taught that way, the impression is an exchange of gifts. We give God bread and wine, and after all, we made it. You see, it's work of human hands, and this is like us. And now here we're giving you us, and you're giving you giving us back you. See, it's an exchange of gifts, and that that is totally different from what the traditional mass is. So there there is that sense of a, a token of participation, and that is the host and the wine. And so I mean, so there's nothing intrinsically wrong with people bringing up the, the host and wine. It's just that in the context of the new mass, it's wrong because there is a a um, um, uh, a sense that it's an exchange of gifts. That's all. You know that that it, we it is sufficient for us to give God bread and wine. <laughs> you know, like you, you go over to somebody's house and you bring a gift. You know, it that's sufficient, and that is not sufficient. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, no, the 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 it is. It is a symbol of the mystical body also being offered up with the body and blood of Christ in the traditional Mass. And all the prayers that reflect that. We'll see that. Uh, let's see. So, uh, if St. Robert Bellarmine teaches, according to the mind of the Doctor of Hippo, that in the sacrifice of the altar there is signified the general sacrifice by which the whole mystical body of Christ, that is, all the city of redeemed, is offered up to God through Christ the High Priest. Nothing can be conceived more just or fitting, that's a quote from the preface, Dinium et Eustem Est, that all of us, in union with our head, who suffered for our sake, should also sacrifice ourselves to the Eternal Father. For in the sacrament of the altar, as uh, the same St. Augustine has it, the Church is made to see that in what she offers, she herself is offered. So that's key to understanding the traditional Mass uh, versus the new Mass. You have to think about that a little bit. This would be very good for meditation. Just reading this again. Very good for meditation. Now we go to the notion of sacrifice because we're not getting into the theology of the Mass. We're going into the general notion of sacrifice.
So, this is from uh, a, cat a very good catechism by the Brothers of the Christian Schools, the Christian Brothers, uh, and I forget the title of it. Uh, but uh, it's uh, so it describes all of this. So I'll get you. I'll get you the references. This is not the final edition. <laughs> so it is essential to the true religion to have a solemn public external act by which men pay homage to God and profess absolute dependence on Him. All right. So that's generally true. I mean, even before you would have revelation. Since God is the principle and end of all things, there is no creature over which he has not an inalienable right. None which by its very creation is not consecrated to the service and the glory of its maker. So that is the relationship of cre creator to creature. That's why evolution is such an evil, wicked thing, because it destroys the most basic religious truth, that there is a creator and a creature, and the creature owes everything to God and is the servant of God. Evolution makes the mythology of the Greeks and Romans look like wisdom. All of the crazy gods of the Aztecs and the Incas is not as sick and weird as evolution. Right. It, because it is based on the principle that something can come from nothing. And you would have to be sick in the head to really think that. Really sick. That the more perfect comes from the less perfect without any cause whatsoever, except chance, which is not a cause. The only thing that makes chance a cause is that you did not see the cause. You say something happened by chance. That means I, don't, I did not see the causes. <laughs> there are causes for everything. You know, if you you meet somebody on the street by chance that you knew 20 years ago. Well, probably for me it would be like 50 years ago. But the, the, there are causes that bring you together, see? And that's not by chance that it happens. It's by specific causes. You just don't know what those causes are. So you say by chance. And we call that a causa per accidents. And you cannot explain the whole universe by chance and the progress, let's say, the supposed progress uh, from gorilla to man by chance. It's sick. It's insane. It's ludicrous. But that's what the world believes. But it, it is, was cooked up in the 19th century precisely to destroy this very sentence that I just said. Because that is the most fundamental religious thought, that there is a creator and I am a creature. I, go, I owe God everything. That's before any revelation. So everything exists for God and everything exists by Him. You see, you'll learn in De Deo Uno, even in philosophy, that if God were not right now thinking about you, present to you and sustaining you in existence, you would, poof, go out of existence. That the act of creation and the act of maintenance in existence is exactly the same for God. All creation would just disappear if he were not sustaining it in existence. So even the sinner is sustained in existence when he is sinning. That's the how intense the presence of God is to the creature. Something to think about. But since what is purely material cannot of itself that should be one word glorify him, 
That should be a capital H. It is through the ministration of rational creatures that God wills to receive tribute, the tribute of adoration, praise, and thanksgiving due to his sovereign majesty. So that's where priests come in. See, that, that human beings carry out this adoration, praise, and thanksgiving to his sovereign majesty. This tribute he receives by sacrifice. There are both interior and exterior sacrifices. The interior sacrifice, God is spirit and truth. No creature of his can glorify him unless it adores him in spirit and truth. So there must be an interior act of religion. This interior sacrifice is demanded of every rational creature at all times and in all places. It is the sacrifice that the blessed in heaven offer him. It is the sacrifice that all men also are to offer him because all are obliged to be united to him by charity. Exterior sacrifice besides the interior offering. All men need an exterior and visible sacrifice because of their nature, their destiny, and the state to which they have been reduced by sin. See, so even before sin, there was, uh, and that's a little disputed, but is, sacrifice has the quality of acknowledging the supremacy of God and the nothingness of man. So that's even before sin. See? But it is especially necessary after sin because then it becomes a statement that we deserve death for sin. By their nature, they are a union of spirit and body, human beings. Therefore, they owe homage both for both to God, their creator. So he must worship in spirit and through the body. So that's why you have liturgical rites, gestures and symbols of adoration of God, because we have bodies. We have eyes, we have noses, ears. They, meaning the human race, are destined to live in society and in unity of religion. Therefore, they are to have external signs to manifest to, excuse me, that should be, to their associates, their agreement of sentiment with them and to edify them by the example of their piety. See, so the liturgical act unifies the human race with regard to a single act of adoration of God. So it is a, it's like a, almost a flag, in other words, something that is recognizable by all those who believe in God. We're talking about the true religion here. So that's why the mass is universal. See, it's not as if you know people in the next diocese do something different from what we do. See, the, there is a universality of the act of worship. That's one of the uh, aspects of the Catholic Church: her unity, unity of worship. Sin has weakened the mind of man greatly. Dependent on the body, therefore, he needs to be led by sensible objects to those sentiments of adoration and annihilation which a creature should entertain in the presence of its God. Sacrifice before the time of Christ. Sacrifice has existed from the time of man's creation. Cain and Abel, sons of Adam, offered sacrifice to God. It's in Genesis. The former of the fruits of the earth, the latter of the firstlings of his flock, the young ones of his flock, sheep. 
This, this practice they had been taught by reason, perhaps also by the instructions of Adam. See, so right away in Genesis, you're seeing sacrifice. Now, it's disputed as to whether or not, if the fall had not taken place, there would have been sacrifice. That's disputed. But certainly after the fall, it's something natural to man. On leaving the ark, Noah built an altar to the Lord and taking uh, of all cattle and fowls that were clean, offered holocausts upon the altar. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Job, and all the patriarchs religiously kept this tradition when, through the ministry of Moses, God gave his law to the Hebrews. He regulated even the minutest details of the sacrifices. That's the book of Leviticus, Deuteronomy. The minutest details. Chose the priests consecrated to offer them. That was the Aaronic priesthood. And while awaiting the time for building the temple of Jerusalem, he had a portable tabernacle constructed in the desert. That was the Ark of the Covenant in a tent. That's why the tabernacle is called tent. It's called the tabernacle. That means tent in Latin. It's, it goes back to the Ark of the Covenant in the tent. Sacrifice was in practice at all times, not only with, that should be capital, sorry, God's people, but also among the idolatrous nations of antiquity. Plutarch, who was a, a Greek writer in Roman times, said, Traverse the earth, you will know where to find a city which has not its temples and its gods, which does not make use of prayers and, and, and oath, that should be and, and oath, which does not consult the oracle, which does not offer a sacrifice to obtain favors from heaven and to ward off the scourges with which it is threatened. That should be, you will know not where, know not where to find. So he's saying that all of these things are present everywhere, and he would have known because he was a person familiar. He was a pagan, so it's not. He wrote the uh, Lives of the Twelve Caesars. See, there were 12 emperors, starting with Julius Caesar and ending with Nero. And those are uh, of the house of Caesar. And those are known as the 12 Caesars. I'm sorry, no, that was uh, Suetonius. Plutarch wrote the, uh, he wrote another history, but anyway. Uh, the, um, but you know, he was, he was a historian. And a very re reliable historian, so that, that would definitely be true. Bloody sacrifice existed always and everywhere. They have these four characteristics. First, the victim is never the culprit. <laughs> See, so the victim is innocent. Second, very often the victim was chosen from among the animals most highly prized for their usefulness, from among the gentlest, the most harmless, the most closely related to men by their instinct and their habits. So the best of the flock, most innocent and harmless. Third, the victim is burned, either wholly or partially. What is not burned is consumed by the sacrificer and by the people. The signification of bloody sacrifices is that they signify not only the supreme homage due to God, Uh, that he is sovereign master of all, all things, but also the need of expiation on the part of man. So the destruction of the victim shows that we are nothing 
before God's omnipotence. The, it also shows that we deserve death because of our sin. And that was common to all humanity. Yes? What does the consuming the victim by the sacrificer and the people indicate specifically? A participation in the sacrifice. Mankind has preserved the memory of a primitive fall. Guilty man knows that he must satisfy divine justice if he would obtain mercy and pardon. His sin can be expiated by nothing short of the sacrifice of his own life. But as he has no right to take his life, he chooses among the brutes the, the kind of of victims, that should be, of uh, victims that are the purest, that are most human, if we may so speak. Also that are innocent. See, they, in the Old Testament, they would put their hands on top of the goat and to transfer sin to him. And then they would sacrifice him or let him go into the Garden of Olives to be, uh, slaughtered by wolves. But that's the reason why you do this at Mass. The transferal of sin on the victim. No, it it's, goes back to that. There's, there's a number of Old Testament things in the Mass. <clears throat> the sacrificer places his hand on the head of the victim to signify that he lays on the beast the burden of people's sins. He plunges, that should be, plunges, plunges the knife into the animal. He receives its blood in a vessel, pours it about the altar, and sprinkles with it the people assisting at the rite. So he sprinkles the altar, and then he sprinkles the people. And you know that is done at the High Mass. Uh, Spurges May, first the altar, then he goes up. Um, and that is reminiscent of baptism. Remember that the water of baptism is representative of the blood of Christ, the blood of the victim. See, so the altar is sprinkled with the blood of Christ, just as in the Old Testament, and then the people are sprinkled too. Yes. And that sprinkling is for the cleaning as baptism is for or cleansing. Yes. Uh, it's a sacramental. Uh, any of those uh, sacramental rites, like the uh, confitier, um, that, if received piously, and if you are sorry for your venial sins, remit venial sin. You have to be sorry. <laughs> uh, so... You can't get any sin remitted, even the smallest sin remitted, if you're not sorry with purpose of amendment, which is part of sorrow. That means I intend not to do it again. You intend. You may fall again, but there and then you must intend not to. You must intend to avoid the occasions of sin. That's all implicit in it. Even a fervent reception of Holy Communion, all venial sin. And, I think, t temporal punishment due to sin. See, but you have to have those conditions. You know, that, uh, uh, so, uh, but the, the asperges right when received piously and with those dispositions remits venial sin. The just man sins seven times a day. <laughs> yes. One more question. What's the sprinkling of the altar for then? Uh, just an imitation of the, uh, of the ancient rite of sprinkling the blood of the victim on the altar. Uh, I, I don't know the exact significance of that, why they did that, but they did. Uh, uh, some sanctification of the altar, perhaps. I don't know. Yeah, so. 
the victim is holy or only partly consumed by fire, and we'll look at these Old Testament sacrifices in the, another section, to show that the natural punishment of crime is fire, hell, and that the flesh of the animal that has been substituted is burned instead of the flesh of guilty man. If anyone partake of the victim by communion, it is to share thereby in the sacred character of the animal that has been immolated. So in some sacrifices of the, of the Old Testament, there was a distribution of the, uh, of the pieces of the animal after it was burned. They wouldn't burn at all. They would burn the fat. That was known as the Holocaust. The practice of human sacrifices among pagan peoples, even those most nearly civilized, shows by a cruel and diabolical exaggeration how thoroughly persuaded man is of the necessity of sanctifying God's justice. So there were horrible, horrible human sacrifices in various. The Greeks did human sacrifice. The, the, all of the ancient peoples did human sacrifice. The Aztecs, and this is horrible, would kill babies at the top of those, those uh, and squeeze the blood out of them into the mouth of an idol and then throw them down there. That was the Aztec, and they would do that the whole day until they ran out of babies. That's the culture that the Spanish disturbed. You know, Cortez, oh, was a terrible, terrible person disturbing that culture. That was their culture. And they would kill their enemies on the top. They would go, you know, invade somebody, bring enemies back, and slaughter them on the top of those pyramids in Mexico. And the North American uh, Indians did the same with uh, their enemies. If their enemy was very um, brave, they would uh, eat him. They would eat his heart to get strength. So they did to Jean de Brébeuf because he was very brave in his, in his uh, resistance. You know, he wasn't giving in to all of the horrible things they were doing to him. They poured boiling water over him to mock baptism. They put a necklace of red-hot hatchet heads around his neck. And, but then they cut out his heart, and the chief ate it. That's the culture that was disturbed. <laughs> Those French Jesuits, oh gosh, terrible. Disturbing those people. <laughs> so, uh, this practice, uh, yes, of themselves, the sacrifices of the old law were not pleasing to God, and they had no virtue either to cleanse man from his sins or to restore him to justice. So, they were all prefigurations of the future sacrifice of the cross. That's the only value they had. It was, they inspired hope in the future sacrifice, the future redemption. And that's how the Hebrews were justified in anticipation of the redemption. There was sanctifying grace in the Old Testament in anticipation. Everything was looking forward to the Redeemer. It says in, in chapter, St. Paul says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 6, Holocausts for sin did not please thee. He's writing to the priests of Jerusalem who are wavering because of the persecutions in Jerusalem. 
And then in Hebrews 9, he says, Gifts and sacrifices are offered which cannot, as to the conscience, make him perfect that serveth only in meats and then drinks. In other words, those things are useless to God. They, they don't please Him at all if they are detached from their significance with regard to this, the sacrifice of the cross. The sacrifices of the old law reminded the Jews of their sentiments with which they should appear in the presence of God. They admonish them of their duty to annihilate themselves in the presence of His Majesty, to thank Him, and to invoke Him as the author of all good, to confess themselves to be sinners deserving of punishment from the justice of God, and to implore His mercy with a con contrite and humble heart. They also imaged for the nature of uh, of them the properties and effects of the great sacrifice of the Messiah which were uh, which uh, they hmm. that means uh, the idea is of which they were a sign a future sign the only sacrifice capable of paying uh, of paying God the honor worthy of Him, of atoning for their sins, and of obtaining for them the gift of justice. Only a small number of the Jews live by faith and offer to God a spiritual worship. So we see that when Christ comes, there is a small number of Jews who are faithful. Some Jews convert. The apostles are of course, St. Joseph and Our Blessed Lady, the, the, the parents of Our Blessed Lady, uh, they, there were pious Jews and who were awaiting the Messiah, many that went out to see St. John the Baptist. There were some pious Jews, but the bulk of them had already uh, rejected the notion of a Messiah that would bring them redemption. They wanted a Messiah that would bring them a revolt against Rome, many of them, or they feared that his popularity would cause the Romans to come down upon them. That was the party of the, the high priests. See, either they were rebellious Galileans who didn't want a humble servant type of redeemer, or they were in cahoots with the Romans and thought if they think that this is a Galilean upstart, they're going to come and take over our country, which is exactly what happened. <laughs> See, when there, in, in about, you know, later on, about 50, uh, 60s AD, there was a revolt against the Romans. They killed some Roman soldiers, and then, of course, Rome, in its usual way, you, you don't kill Roman soldiers. That's it. So Rome sent an enormous army to uh, Palestine. And uh, in Galilee, they just threw down their arms in front of the Roman soldiers. They didn't bother. They didn't bother to, because they came down from the north. And so they met Jews on the battlefield in Galilee, which is the north. And they just threw down their arms in front of the Romans. And that's where Josephus defected to the Romans, the famous historian. And, and uh, so then they went on to Jerusalem, and you know the rest of the story after that. It was a, it was a very difficult siege for the Romans, though. The, the Jews put up a big fight. But finally the Romans prevailed, and they, they destroyed Jerusalem. And then the, the Jews uh, took refuge in Masada to the south of Jerusalem, which exists to this day, the ruins of it, on a big high hill. And so the Romans pursued them there. And uh, there they, uh, they fought the Romans again. The Romans built a big ramp up to the top of it, typical Roman. Uh, and, uh, but before they were going to take it over, uh, uh, and when they got up there, as a matter of fact, they found that all, every them, all of them had committed suicide. 
that was Masada, instead of being taken by the Romans. They all killed themselves. That was the remnant left over from the siege of Jerusalem. And then, uh, so then the, uh, a lot of the, uh, the Jew, they, they exiled a lot, but uh, it remained a, a still a, what you call a Jewish state. In other words, a, it was still the homeland of the Jews until they revolted again in about 130 A.D., Hadrian being the emperor, he again. And they spread the revolt into Egypt and northern Africa. So, you know, Rome was just, Rome doesn't fool around. And so he uh, exiled all of them out of that area and called it Palestine, Palestina. You see? And so they all went into the east, Babylon and all of those places. And that's where the Talmud was, the famous Talmud was written. There's a Palestinian Talmud and then there's a Babylonian Talmud. The, ta the Babylonian is the worst, the one that's more hostile to Christianity. So, uh, so only a small number uh, were faithful to God and who looked upon the sacrifices as figures of the promised Savior of the, uh, and that, uh, hmm, uh, of the promised Savior, uh, and they really understood these truths. But the majority of the people were gross and carnal, gross in the sense that uh, not spiritual, and saw in them only what appealed to sense. They imagined that the blood of the animals shed at the foot of the altar and the smoke of their fat ascending into heaven were, that should be, were very agreeable to God and obtained both pardon for sin and the blessing sought. Nevertheless, they did not reckon justice and holiness among these blessings. See, so it was a purely ritual religion. Again, just offer the sacrifices, God is pleased, but it doesn't trickle down into your morality. We'll just finish this. The sacrifices offered to God from the beginning of the world were agreeable to Him only insofar as they were figures of the sacrifice of His Son. Those who offered them to Him could be pleasing to Him and obtain graces of salvation from Him only by believing in the great sacrifice to come and by placing all their confidence in the infinite merit of the victim uh, to be there to be immolated, that should be there to be immolated, for, uh, for the salvation of mankind. It is for this reason that St. John in the Apocalypse speaks of the Lamb which was slain from the beginning of the world. See, so the the Lamb of God, in that sense, was slain from the beginning of the world because God, in His infinite wisdom, uh, even before the world was created, saw the redemption. He foresaw the, uh, the sacrifice of His Son. All right.